Coming up on Doctype, is your CSS an absolute mess? Then it's time to clean things up with some sass. Then, turn your HTML markup into haiku poetry with Hamel. It's Tuesday, and that can only mean one thing. It's time for Doctype! This episode of Doctype is brought to you by Colab Orlando and GoDaddy. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that thinks JavaScript is a decaf latte, or a developer who can't tell his margin from his padding, Doctype has the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help make you the emperor of the interwebs. Oh my, yes. Now, if you missed it last week, we are now on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed already, you can head over to youtube.com slash user slash Doctype TV and check out our channel. If you're going to be at the Future of Web Apps London next week, stop by and say hi, because we're going to be getting on a plane in just a few days. And also, if you haven't voted for Doctype as Video Podcast of the Year, please, please, please head over to thenetawards.com and vote for Doctype. This week, I'll be showing you how to clean up your HTML with Hamel. And I will be showing you how to clean up your CSS with SAS. Let's check it out. SAS, spelled S-A-S-S, -S, is an acronym that stands for Syntactically Awesome Style Sheets. It's an extension of CSS3 that allows you to add in advanced concepts like nested rules, variables, mixins, and more. You can vastly simplify your CSS and do a whole lot more with SAS, and you can download the code at sas-lang.com. We'll get into the specifics in just a moment, but first, how do you install SAS? Well, this episode is a bit more advanced than normal, so I'm going to go ahead and assume that you've already installed Ruby or that you know how to get it. If you have Mac OS X, Ruby is already installed on your computer, but if you need some more help, you can visit ruby-lang.org. Now, once you have Ruby, you'll need to download Haml, which is a templating language that allows you to create markup really easily. To get Haml, you just need to type gem install Haml at your command prompt. And that's it. You now also have SAS. Just to remind you, Jim will be talking more about Haml in just a little bit. So now that we have SAS installed, how can we use it to simplify our CSS? Well, as you can see here, there's actually two different syntaxes that you can use. There's the newer SCSS syntax in SAS 3, which you can see on the left, and there's the original indented syntax on the right. If you like your curly braces, you can try out SCSS on your own, but I'm going to teach you the more concise version, which is the indented syntax. On the left side, we have some SAS code, and on the right, we have the equivalent CSS code. What you'll notice about the indented SAS syntax first is that there are no curly braces and no semicolons. Right away, this makes for less typing. The way that SAS gets away with this while remaining organized is by imposing strict rules about indentation. For example, let's just focus on this one piece of SAS code. Look at the way SAS defines the font properties on the list item selector. They first type out the selector and then go one indentation deep to find the font property, go another indentation deep, and then to find the individual font properties. When your SAS code is translated into CSS, it will be expanded out with semicolons, curly braces, and best of all, proper indentation. Once you've created your first SAS file, it's really easy to translate into CSS. All you have to do is run SAS watch, and then the path to your SAS file, and then the path to your CSS file. And anytime you save your SAS file, it'll translate into CSS again. If you have a whole directory of SAS files that you want to translate all at once, you can simply specify the directory in the same way you would specify a SAS file, and then tell SAS which directory you'd like to save your normal CSS files to. And just as before, they'll be auto-updated every time that you save. So let's get into some more advanced syntax. I've already shown you the indentation style of common selectors and properties, but that's only a small part of what makes SAS really powerful. This is an example of nesting. Here, we're nesting a selector for a table cell inside of another selector for a table with the class HL. 
As you can see on the right, we would normally have to first select the table, apply our styling, and then select the table cell inside of the table and apply styling to that. With SAS on the left, we can simply select the proper table once, apply styling, and then nest other selectors inside of that. SAS also allows you to use variables in CSS, which is really cool. A lot of times in your CSS, you'll have a color or a set of margins that you keep using over and over again. Then when you want to adjust just that one value, you have to change it everywhere, which is really annoying. But SAS fixes all that. With SAS, you can simply change the value once and it will be reflected throughout all your code. To define a variable in SAS, you type a dollar sign, the name of your variable, a colon, and then the value. Then in your code, you can type dollar sign with the name of your variable and its value will be dropped right in once it's compiled to CSS, which you can see on the right. This is what's called a mix-in, which is basically a reusable chunk of code. You can think of it like a function or an advanced variable. First, define a mixin with the at symbol, the word mixin, and then the name of your mixin. Below that, you can define selectors and properties. Here, we have a mixin called table base and a mixin called left. At the bottom, there's an ID selector called data that uses both of these mixins. And then on the right, you can see how this is translated into CSS. You'll also notice that the mixin titled left can actually take parameters like function. Now, I'll be honest with you, when you first try out SAS, you'll probably end up hating it. But if you just give it a chance for a day or two, you'll probably end up really enjoying it. If you're in Orlando and you're watching this show, you need to be at Colab Orlando. Located in the heart of downtown, Colab Orlando has become a magnet for creative thinkers and entrepreneurs like you and me. If you're just stopping by for the day, or if you're starting the next big thing, Colab has you covered. With affordable office space, high-speed internet, and a great environment built for collaboration, Colab is the best place to co-work. Even we work there now. And if you're not in Orlando, be sure to check out the new Colab space that just opened up in downtown Nashville. If you want to become a member of Colab, or if you're just curious, be sure to check them out at colabusa.com. HAML stands for HTML Abstraction Markup Language, and it's a templating system designed to make HTML more easy to read and write, as well as easy to maintain. You can find more information at haml-lang.com. Now, originally it's been designed for the Ruby programming language, but other implementations exist for various other programming languages, including Python, Perl, PHP, ASP.NET, and many more. Its syntax is based loosely on the CSS syntax and using indentation to define nesting. To define a tag, we're going to use the percentage sign for the tag name. So we're going to take a look at an example of Haml and the HTML that it generates. In this example, we're using the percent div to define a div tag, and then the text after it is going to be placed inside of our div tag, so we can see our div with hello world inside. We can see we can also create an emphasis tag by using percent %em and passing it some content. So you can see that after the percentage sign, the div is what actually becomes the type of tag. Now we can also nest our tags together. So in this case, we're creating a ul tag. And then by indenting the lines beneath it, we're saying that these tags should be inside the ul tag. So we're having an li with the text first list item, and then another li with a strong tag indented inside of that with second list item. Finally, we have an emphasis tag, and you can see it's been outdented to the exact same level as the ul tag, meaning that the emphasis is not inside the ul tag, but immediately after it. We can see that the HTML it generates is below. The hash symbol is used to define the ID of a tag. It's a shorthand syntax, so if we wanted to create a span with the ID of username, we can simply add a hash username to our tag definition. When it's translated, the username will be added to the ID attribute of our span tag. We can see another example where we're creating a div with the ID header, and then we have text indented inside of that with our h1 with site title. Now, since divs are so commonly used, if you omit the actual tag when you're using an ID or a class name, it'll actually default to being a div tag. So in this case, these two lines are identical, the percent div with the ID message, or just using the hash sign message to say we're having a div with the ID message. So by default, it uses a div tag when none is passed. 
Now just like in CSS, the dot is used to represent class names of our tags. So in this case, we're going to be creating a span with the class warning. So to do that, we do percent span dash warning, and we can see that the warning class is moved into the class attribute of our generated HTML tag. Now we can actually add multiple classes to our tags by using multiple dots. So in this case, we're using the em tag and doing dot highlight dot danger. So when the HTML is generated, it'll have both a highlight and a danger class separated by spaces. Now, just like with our IDs, if we have a HTML tag without the actual percent tag defined, it'll default to being a div. So in this case, we can have a shorthand where we're having the hash results, and inside of that dot results, since we don't have a tag defined, it all ends up being generated as divs. Besides classes and ID attributes, other attributes can be added to our classes by using the curly braces. After we've defined our tag name and possible class name and ID name, we can open up curly braces and use a hash notation to define any other attributes that we want to add. In this case, we want to create an A tag with an href to our website. So we just do percent %A and we're giving it a class home. And then opening up our curly braces and passing href is doc type TV. So we can see the generated code has the href property. Now this will work on any property, and you can see that the class property is also combined into it, even when we use the shorthand class notation. Now we've seen that in other lines, when there's no special characters at the beginning of our line, it's just interpreted as normal text and output into the code. But sometimes our text might have a special character to lead with. For instance, if we had a line where we wanted to define our doc type hashtag, we might want to use the pound doc type TV is our hashtag, but that would result in the erroneous code of having a div with the ID of doc type, and then the content of is our hashtag. To circumvent that, we would lead with a trailing backslash, and then all of our code will be interpreted as plain text. Now in our templates, we often want to have dynamic code output. When we end our tag with an equal sign or begin our line with an equal sign, it means that the rest of our line will be interpreted as native code and its results will be output into the code. So in this example, we're creating a div with the ID answer and we're trailing it with an equal sign. That means everything after the equal sign will be interpreted by its native language, in our case Ruby, but depending on your implementation, it's going to be another language. So we're evaluating two plus two and then the generated content will be four. We can also lead our line with an equal sign to insert normal code in place. So in this case, we're using answer with the answer is on one line, and then our next line we want to interpret a dynamic answer, so we begin with an equal sign, have two plus two, and then the final code has it all merged together. Finally, sometimes we just want to have code that is not output into our HTML. That's when the dash comes in handy. For example, in this case, we want to set a variable, so we lead off our line with the dash. We can set the result equals four times seven, and then later on, we can use the equal sign to echo out that content into our HTML. Another example of using the dash is for things like ifs, else, loops, and other language constructs. So if we have an if statement, we start off with a dash and then use our if statement, and then anything indented into that will be part of that if clause, we can also have an else clause and indent to show what should be in the else case. So in this case, since two is less than 10, we get the first code block, which is a div with the class hooray and the content math works. Now you can install Haml using the instructions that Nick gave for installing SAS and play with it yourself. Now, when you first start playing with it, it may be a little bit jarring and you might not know what's going on, but after you use it for a couple hours, you're probably gonna find it hard to go back to full HTML. Listen, you need a domain name. You know it, I know it, but where are you gonna go get it? GoDaddy, that's where. If you're looking to drive viewers to your video content, then .tv domains are where it's at. .tv domains are perfect for podcasters, video bloggers, and anyone with something to say. And they're available now at GoDaddy.com. Heck, where do you think we got Doctype.tv from? So we know you all get your domains from GoDaddy, but whose code are you gonna use? Enter the code Doctype3 when you check out and save an additional 10% off your entire order. Some restrictions apply see site for details get your piece of the internet at godaddy.com that's it for this week until next time be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype tv on twitter and if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of doctype send us an email at questions at doctype.tv and if you subscribe via itunes or rss or youtube you'll never miss an episode of doctype so until next tuesday remember that every great web page starts with doctype 
yeah, Scene true. 11, take one. <laughs> <laughs> that's for the blooper reel. All right. <laughs>